Welcome all, and thank you for joining today's Adabri webinar. My name is Matt Holdstock, and I'm a senior knowledgeist at the Australian Wine Research Institute. In today's session, we'll be hearing about the new EU labelling laws with a webinar titled Data to Help Producers Manage New EU Labelling Requirements. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Adabri acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing the funding and support for the webinar program via the Adabri Extension and Communications Project. But before we jump in and make a start, a couple of quick reminders to anyone who is new to the Adabri webinar program. If you'd like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click to send it through. We will hold a Q&A session at the end of this presentation, but feel free to send in questions at any stage throughout. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and the link will be sent through you to later today to view via the Adabri's YouTube channel. For anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is data to help producers manage new EU labelling requirements. And it is great pleasure. I would like to welcome this morning, Dr. Eric Wilkes from the Adabri. Eric has worked in the beverage industry since completing his PhD in chemistry at the University of Newcastle in 1997, prior to joining the Adabari in 2011, where he's general manager, commercial and regulatory affairs. He held a range of national and, and global roles in wine and beverage production with companies such as Rose Mountain Estates, Foster's and P&N Beverages. Eric is a past chair of the Interwinery Analysis Group, co-chair of the FIV's Scientific and Technical Committee and an industry representative in the World Wine Trade Group and an active member of the International Working Groups for organisations such as Codex and the OIV. He also, sorry, Eric is also a regular speaker at the National and International Regulatory and Wine Chemistry Conferences. So Eric, if you're ready to start, I will hand the control over to you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to this webinar on what unfortunately is a little bit of a dry topic, but one that is necessary for all our EU exporting. So the first thing I will do is, sorry, I'm just getting the slide control to work, is a quick disclaimer. Um, the data in, that we're presenting this is general advice only. And you know, we're talking about regulatory areas. So it's really important that before you make any decisions on labeling, et cetera, you do do your own due diligence and check that the information really does apply to where you are. But it has been prepared with all due care and we're very and it does work as general um, advice. So you nearly have to be living under a rock to not be aware that as of last Friday, um, there's new regulations have been applied in Europe for labeling of wine. Essentially all wine produced after that 8th of December date will need an on-label on energy statement and either on-label or online ingredient or or ingredient and nutritional information. Um, Wine Australia has got some great information about what produced means, but essentially it's going to mostly impact wines from our 2024 vintage and some sparkling wines produced um, after that date. But I encourage you to have a look at the Australian Wine, um, Wine Australia website for that sort of information. But the main thing I think I'd like people to be aware of is that this is not going to stop with the EU. There are many markets now currently reviewing the regulations for alcoholic beverages around nutritional ingredient labeling. And I think it's a safe bet to say that this will come in force in some form in many other markets um, going forward. And it is currently under review with the Zant for Australia and New Zealand. 
if you're doing nutritional labeling, testing for these parameters costs around $300 Australian per wine. So it is a significant cost if you're going to have to test for information for nutritional parameters. So realistically, it's really important that we find a way that we can comply without these sort of costs going forward. And that's pretty well um, what this presentation is about. So I'm just going to point you at um, the Wine Australia website once again. That QR code will actually take you to the appropriate page, but they have a lot of information about the ingredient labeling, the nature and um, conditions for those online labels. So please use that resource as well. It's really, really important. I'm not going to talk about the ingredient listing through here because that's pretty well defined um, when it comes to how do you create an online nutritional information ingredient label there's a heap of online providers out there that can do it for you and once again i think there's some general advice on that on the wine australia website so for that part please have a look at those resources what we're going to talk about today is where do you get and what information do you need to fill out this nutritional panel, which you can see in some mock-ups here, where you need to have information on energy, fats and their saturates, carbohydrates and sugars, protein and salt, and what sort of numbers do we can we use from those? So to try to get a handle on that, um, we have been collating data for the last 12 months as it's become available to us. We've been getting wines and wine products tested by an accredited facility that special, well, does specialize in providing this for food and beverages. The sample set included red, whites and rosés, and it also contained some low and no, well, low alcohol wines in the sample set as well. So, what do we do see? Well, for fats and proteins, the data was pretty straightforward. And this is one of the most boring tables I've ever got the pleasure to present. Um, people who know me know I like to graph things, but it's very hard to graph zero. So yeah, the important numbers there, you can see all the fats are zero. And the protein, if we look at the sort of maximum value there we saw is about 0.4 grams per 100 mils. So that's probably a very a very protein rich um, unfined white wine to get to that sort of level. So yeah, very important. The other thing to look at is those EU tolerance numbers there on the extreme right. And in the case of fats, it's just interesting to see the tolerance they've got is 1.5 grams per litre, which is about 15, well, not about, it is 15, sorry, grams per litre. And that would be the equivalent of about 11 grams in a 750 mil bottle. I'm pretty sure if you had that much um, fat in a wine, you'd have a nice gum sitting at the top of the bottle. So it just reinforces that this stuff has all been developed for foods. It's not wine specific in any way. So what does that mean for labeling for fats and proteins? Um, Essentially, for fats, we're, it's a safe call for us to declare them as zero grams per 100 mils. So the table on the left there is the rounding rules from the EU regulations. And so as long as you're below um, 0.5 grams per 100 mils or 5 grams per litre, you can label that as zero. Or if you chose to, you could say less than 0.5. Same for, for the saturates, we're going to be below that 0.1 number, so that's all good. So we're safe to call them zero. And for the proteins, the limit is, once again, less than 0.5 grams. So it would be highly, highly unlikely for a typical dry or semi-dry wine to get above those numbers. We would probably be suggest people are very careful for botrytized products or some of the other things just to be, a, you know, just show a little bit of care and due diligence for those because we don't have those in this data set and we'd like to follow a bit more up, follow up a bit more on those. 
So for fats and proteins, you don't need to do any testing. We are very confident that you can use a typical value of zero. We have actually published this data for fats and proteins in the latest technical review, which is available online on the AWRI website. We look at the salt values we had for those 66 wines. We can see that it's not a non-zero process. And it's really important to remember that we don't actually measure sodium chloride in wine. It's actually not practically possible because the sodium chloride numbers don't line up. And what the EU regulation asks us to do is measure sodium, essentially multiply it by 2.5, and that gives us a number of sodium in the form of salt sodium chloride and they call that salt so that's the number they get there so this is a limited data set it says it's only 66 wines luckily we have a much bigger data set available from the affinity labs uh, analytical database where we've looked at about 1800 wines and the numbers we see for that is that the average value is about 0.013 with 95% of wines being below 0.03. Those numbers will be important in a moment. And you can see the distribution for that in those graphs below. So if we look at the tolerances for salt in the, um, and the rounding guidelines there, that um, the zero declaration limit is 0.0125 grams per 100 mils. Roughly half the Australian wines are above that level. So that means that there is some risk at, in declaring zero just automatically for those, or even saying less than 0.01. We would have a tendency to say that it would be better to declare a number around 0.03 grams per 100 mil, which is the 95th percentile there. Um, and this is really well supported by the fact that the tolerance for that measurement is 0.375 grams per 100 mil. There's not a zero missing there. That's the tolerance. So there is an argument that you could say zero because you'd still be within the measurement tolerance. And I think if it was legally challenged for a wine that went to Europe to say zero gram, if you labeled it as zero and it got a challenge in Europe, in one of the regulatory markets, you would probably win any case that was brought up, but you could find yourself spending months with a product stuck in a container on a dock waiting there. So we think it's a much lower risk thing to do to declare a number like 0.03 or up or down from there. And you will be covered. You There will be no issues with going forward from there. It is still, compared to most foods and beverages, a very, very low number. So it won't cause any problems with consumers. Moving on to sugars and carbohydrates. Um, so the rounding rules for that are if it's less than 0.5 grams per 100 mils or 5 grams per litre, you can say zero again. Um, you have to be above above those it's the nearest point one but one of the nice things is if you're exporting wines to europe you will have a sugar value for that you've declared on your export license so there won't be extra analysis that you need to do you can use that and realistically for the vast majority of wines so about 91 percent of red wines in australia and 74 percent of whites are less than four grams per litre or less than what we'd call dry, um, you can declare those as zero. Otherwise, you can just use the number that you have for the sugar in there. For the carbohydrates, um, there's a little bit of a, a wrinkle, if you'd like, through there. Um, in the EU... In carbohydrates, they also include polyols, and the only real polyol we're worried about is glycerol, whereas in Australia, glycerol is specifically excluded from the carbohydrates. It's just the regulatory thing and how they define them. So when you're declaring the carbohydrate component, you need to take the sugar value and add a figure for glycerol. 
And we've done some work which we published um, back in 21, which showed that, you know, the typical glycerol value for a white wine was 0.5 grams per 100 mils and about one gram per 100 mils for red wines. All you need to do is for the carbohydrate is add that glycerol figure to the sugar figure and you'll have a declarable number up there. Now, you can see that for carbohydrates that you still those numbers will have to be declared. You won't be able to say zero grams for those. Even though there is quite a large tolerance, it's still going to have to be declared, I would think. So then we're on to energy values. And um, once again, the thing to remember is that the energy value calculations is not just done for wine specifically. It's designed around foods and beverages in general. And so we have a set of ingredients and components that we have to take into account. And you are encouraged to use a calculation from generally established and accepted data, which is really us saying they encourage people to use average numbers and not to measure them. Um, it's pretty explicitly said in the regulations fair. So this is straight from those regulations. Um, I've highlighted the polyols bit because that's just a little one more difference compared to um, what we have in Fizan's guidelines where glycerol, if you are using it in an energy calculation, then it has a different um, energy factor. Here we need to use 10 kilojoules per gram. It's just a different number through there, but it doesn't make a huge difference to what we see. So how do we calculate this? Um, for wine, it's reasonable to use this equation, which we've published in that um, references in the previous um, slide from um, Tech Review there. I'm not going to go through it in detail other than say you've got a component for the wine, a component for the sugar, a component for the acids, and a component for the glycerol. But nicely, um, looking at typical values for Australian wine, we can say for reds that we can take a figure of 6.2 grams per litre for the acids, um, for the red, sorry, for the acid, and for whites, 6.3. If your wine is anywhere between five and seven, it makes less than one kilojoule per 100 mils difference no matter what the number is. So using those generic numbers is fine. And as we've already stated, we've got numbers for glycerol from a survey we've done before. So that means that we can simplify that equation down to for reds, it's the alcohol times 23 plus the sugar times 1.7 plus 18 for reds. And it's exactly the same for whites, but it's plus 13 because there's less glycerol in that. So it's a really simple equation essentially just using numbers that you will have already for your wine export declaration. So what do these energy values end up looking like? Um, and I'll just draw your attention to the histogram on the left, and sorry, not the histogram, the box plot on the left there. And the really interesting thing, and I use the interesting term being an absolute nerd, but that's okay, is that the variation that we see in reds and whites for dry and semi-dry wines is minuscule. It's really tiny. There's just not that much variation. It's driven by the alcohol, the sugar having next to no impact there. So it does look like that the numbers that we see for both reds and whites are pretty standard for dry and semi-dry wines. Now, as soon as you get into semi-sweet and sweet, we see much bigger variations, but that's not surprising because the sugars are becoming quite a big influencer there. And so if we just look at the dry and semi-dry wines only, you can see the distribution of the energy values there. And although they are different for reds and whites, it, they're not over a huge range there. So this gives us a chance to maybe simplify things again. And the first thing I've just got to note, because people are asking this all the time, is that there is no EU tolerance for energy. So as in, they don't have a figure to say it's plus or minus a percentage is acceptable. They haven't published one. It doesn't exist. There's a rule of thumb that's used in most foods and beverages of about 
and that's based on the contribution to energy of all the ingredients that are in there because they all have de um, tolerances around 20 percent but because alcohol is the bigger driver biggest driver for energy in wine and there is no tolerance defined for alcohol in the food in the tables that we use for this then we don't actually have a tolerance for the energy component there it just needs to be fought so the guidance document tells us that um, business operators should act in good faith in other words you should be relatively honest to ensure a high degree of accuracy of the nutrition declaration so that's the energy as well as all the other things and in particular declared value should approximate to the average value across multiple batches and should not be established at either extreme of a defined tolerance range now we don't have a tolerance range but yeah we can use averages is what i think that's telling us so let's have a look at white wine so if we get rid of the top and top five and bottom five percent of wines based on alcohol so we get rid of those outliers in that and just look at wines between 11 and 14 percent abv and less than 12 grams per liter of sugar so the dry and semi-dry wines what we see is that um pretty well all the wines if you just declared 304 kilojoules per 100 mils which is the median value all the wines easily fall in the tolerance of 20 percent as said, there is no defined tolerance, but if we go to a tolerance of 10%, still using that number, about 95% of results fall within that. So there's a pretty good argument that you can use a average value for energy for your wines going forward. We can do exactly the same thing for red wines, but obviously the alcohol range varies a bit from the white one because they tend to be higher for red wines, but we have a median energy value of 344 kilojoules. And once again, if we use a 20% tolerance, all the wines easily fall within that. But even for a 10% tolerance, 98% of wines fall within that. So unless you're right at the edges of those things, it looks like a median value of something like 344 kilojoules per 100 mils would give you an acceptable number that meets that criteria that we've seen from the EU question and answer guide. So what would a nutritional panel look like? If you're talking about a wine that's dry or semi-dry and is in a reasonable sugar range from there, here are two example nutritional information panels that I've created based on a median sugar of uh, for a red wine of one gram per litre, so most Australian wines are near that level, and 1.5 for white wines. And you can see that's what you can fill out without actually doing any extra analysis at all. Now, as I said, it makes sense to do get the calculated value for those um, energy things and to use real sugar numbers if you can but you can come up with a very generic nutritional label based on average values. So in summary, um, all Australian wines can have a declared nutritional value of fats and saturates of zero grams per 100 mils, proteins as zero grams per 100 mils, salt, um, there's a typo on that straight away, you should have seen that, of 0.03 grams per 100 mils, um, but you could... If you're confident that your wine is lower in sodium, you can go to those lower numbers. Sugars can simply use the analyzed value of zero grams per 100 mils if they're less than five grams per liter for sugar. And carbohydrates, we can get simply using the standard glycerol figures as we described before. Now you could use a average energy value, but until they clarify or give us more information of is there going to ever be a tolerance for energy that's defined? You can calculate it really simply just using the sugar and the alcohol content for your wines. So that's a quick summary. As I said, a few considerations. 
the OIV, the AOC methods or Codex Alimentarius have not defined analytical methods for fats, proteins, et cetera, for wine. They have it for other beverages. So there may end up being some disputes about the actual numbers that come up for these, but it's not going to realistically impact these nutritional methods because the, the actual tolerances for fats and proteins and that are well-defined and the accuracy of the methods are not going to really impact them for typical dry and semi-dry wines. If we were to recommend to use an average value approach, in other words, say, use 304 or 344 kilojoules per 100 mils, you really do need to define what that wine, what wines that applies to. It's going to be something like for whites between 11 and 14% and less than 12 grams sugar, and for reds between 12 and a half and 15 and a half and less than 12 grams sugars. If you try to apply those average values outside of that range, and this is for energy, fats and proteins, we're pretty safe you probably will run into problems because you're you're going to those extremes of the tolerances. And it's really important that we keep collating this work um, and pulling more and more information together. We're actually working on an international collaboration at the moment to co collect data from around the world for fats, proteins, salt, et cetera, which we hope to turn into an OIV paper so that there's an international reference to back up any of these average values that we're using um, for labeling for the EU. But the biggest thing that I'll put forward to people is please don't overthink any of this. Um, it's very, very easy for people to get into, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and you know, end up spending a lot of money doing um, analysis and such. It realistically isn't needed. Energy can be done with a simple calculation, fats and proteins, can be addressed using zero grams per 100 mils and for salts making a declaration of around 0 0.3 0 0.03 grams per 100 mil will cover wines very safely in the Australian context so thank you so much for that um, thanks to Affinity Labs and Wine Australia for supporting us doing this work and also need to thank Paul Huckaber of Bronco Wines and Jennifer Turner of, of WTSA in the UK, who've been really helpful in providing and sense checking a lot of the issues around the regulatory facts in this sort of stuff. And as I said, Affinity Labs, as always, for helping me with lots of data going forward. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. That's That was great. Um, look just remind everyone if they want to send a question through, they're more than welcome to. Um, there's been a few questions come through already. Um, first one, Eric, is relating to QR codes. Question goes, I was wondering if the same QR code can be used for multiple vintages, showing the data for each. Surely this would save um, having to label uh, every year. No, sorry, this would save having to change the QR code on the label every year. Um. Good question, and I don't have a quick answer for that. That's the first time anyone's asked me on vintage, the vintage variation. Um, and realistically, it's a possibility, but I'd probably lean towards putting that question to Wine Australia to see if there's been any advice on that from a regulatory point of view. But I would agree that the numbers are not going to change from vintage to vintage, um, but you do have to be specific about the wine. And so I'm just wondering if, if you have to be specific about the wine, whether the vintage is considered a specific component of that through there. So it's really about what's going to come up on the screen when you when a consumer goes to that to that um, online version of it, which is going to say, um, you know, Aardvark wines, blah blah blah, Cabernet you need to be specific about that because the consumer needs to know that it is for that wine, but you're quite right. It's there are, they are essentially generic values. And so you'd like to think that's doable, but I would um, suggest that that question is put specifically to wine Australia to see if we can do that. A good question. 
This one sort of follows on from that as well, and, and, and you may have already answered that one, this one as well. If we allow QR codes, can we use the same code in multiple languages perhaps, or will we end up using two different QR codes or more for one product depending on the market? No, so yeah, that's one of the things that works really well for the QR codes. So what the providers are doing is when someone goes to that QR code, it looks at where their what where the request is originating from so the ip of the address that it's originating from and it automatically should translate it to the language of that market so what all these providers and the, the clever people who build these websites are doing are using geotagging of where the request is coming from to define what the language is that's going to be there which actually saves a lot of effort because it's automatically translated so yeah that's how the qr code systems are meant to work and save us everyone a lot of grief hopefully there's been a specific question regarding carbohydrates come through so the question yep. reads for carbohydrates does the eu include organic acids in the calculations not for carbohydrates but they do for polyols um, which is the difference for for Zant's through there. So my, our reading of that is carbohydrates are taken as in the food code. Carb organic acids are treated separately to carbohydrates, so they're not considered that. But polyols are, so glycerol, which we'd exclude in Australia, are included in carbohydrates through there. Okay, and another one relating to alcohol. Should you use the alcohol content on the label or the actual measured alcohol in the product? So what we recommend at the moment is to use the actual alcohol because if it was going if your number is going to be challenged, it'll be challenged on um it's much more defensible to say here's the measured number through there. It's not going to be challenged on. It doesn't line up with the alcohol label through there. The difference is going to be only about 5%, probably for most um, wines, given the tolerances, probably a bit less than that, about 4%. But yeah, we'd always recommend using the actual alcohol because in the case of it being challenged, that's the defensible number based on the European regulations where they ask you to be as accurate as possible. Um, whereas the label tolerances are different to what we would call the food safety tolerances. Eric, there's been a, um, a comment put in the question and answer box uh, relating to that first question about electronic e-tags or e-labels. Um, it's, I'll just read it out just FYI, the bottle books guide states below caution. Once an e-label is in the market, you should not update it unless the information needs to be corrected. For instance, do not use the same e-label for the new vintage by updating the information on the old vintage e-label. This will result in a non-compliance with the old vintage. Yep, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so to go back to the original question, which I'm not which, as I said, I would lean towards Wine Australia. Um, if if the numbers remain the same, say you said that the numbers haven't changed year on year on year on year, but it is tempting to use just one QR code. But if the num definitely if the numbers are changing for those QR codes, you actually have to have the information available for the old vintage as well as the new vintage. So that's really important through there. You can't just keep replacing it and update it from there because essentially as long as someone can theoretically access that wine and that includes it sitting in their cellar for 20 years or in the, on the top of the fridge for 20 years because they've forgotten about it, they will need to be able to access that data for that vintage. So that's pretty important there. Okay, look. Yep, there's another question that's just popped in. Um, will there be a similar tolerance for energy in other markets like South Korea? As I said, there is no tolerance for energy, so it's hard to answer that at the moment, but we do think so. Um, pretty well all the, um, all the markets who are 
asking for energy labels are using the same sort of tolerances they have for foods. And they, if you can imagine that there has to be a tolerance for most foods because the amount of um, flour, the amount of sugar, all those things of the recipes can vary from batch to batch a little through there and the same for wine. So we do expect there to be reasonable tolerances in all markets going forward, but never say never because you've got to be really careful when it comes to rot wine regulatory spaces. But we're reasonably confident so that we'll be able to work in that sort of space. Okay, look, there hasn't been any more questions come through. So look, um, I would just like to thank Eric for joining us today and providing insights into the new EU labelling uh, requirements. And I'm sure everyone who attended today got a lot out of this session. I'd also like to thank you as the audience for logging in and taking part. And I'd just like to remind you that, as always, you will receive a link to view the recording of this presentation, which will be available on the AdRise YouTube channel in the next 24 hours. This will be the last webinar for the calendar year so uh, i wish everyone a merry christmas and a safe and happy new year and just like to thank you again for joining today and i look forward to seeing you at the next adroy webinar in early 2024 um matt there's just one other question has just come up on the question and answer ah. can i just jump in on that one sure um i get what you're saying but it does come down to this person's asked if the actual abv is different than what's on the label and the energy output is based on the actual ABV, wouldn't it be kind of misleading? No, because that the argument would be, is the alcohol label misleading if you're using the actual thing through there? The tolerances are treated differently um, for labeling and it's considered to achieve a different thing. And the reality is that the difference between for an EU label between the actual um, value and like the energy calculated from the differences between there would only be 5% and it's that's well and truly within the margin of tolerance that we'd expect for that. So it is always going to be better to use the actual ABV, even though it may lead to a slightly different number compared to the label um, ABV. Okay, great. Thanks again, Eric. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining today and we'll see you at the next Adderall webinar. Thank you all.